honest and truly, I've uh, I've been praying about tonight, just inquiring of the Lord. You know, give me give me something, uh, nothing. So I don't know how we do tonight. We do it one syllable at a time, one 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 little bit at a time because I really don't know. And that's what's so really cool is this whole deal that we this proclamation and the the feast of booths and a week of tabernacling with God and a day of prayer, fasting and humiliation. We presented that to a group of people across the whole globe. But it's individuals. Each individual. Tonight, nobody will ask you what you did today or what you didn't do. Or anytime somebody called me and said, what are we supposed to do? Don't ask me. Ask the Lord. Be directed by God. That's what we're headed to here is being directed by God. We've been so directed by man. And so just like yesterday morning, I did a pretty darn thorough teaching on fasting after Alan had done one on Sunday. And then I come back in there yesterday morning. But I told everybody, where we're sitting there talking, those of you who are here, some of you tuned in. And I said, you know what's funny? I read Matthew 6 one day. And the Bible simply said, when you fast, when you fast, those three words, when you fast. I was a brand new believer. Now, I've been going to church for a while. Wasn't nothing. They talked a lot about tithing, didn't talk very much about fasting, like zero. And I thought, okay, the Bible says, when you fast. So apparently, God thinks I'm supposed to do this, and I don't even know what it is. So I went and found out. That makes me curious about standing up here for 30 years, 20-something years, been saved about 30 up here, 20-something, telling people what I think, what I feel like God's shown me in the Bible. Just like prayer, fasting, humiliation, feast of booze. This has been a deep dive now for three months. I don't step out of it, not 15 seconds. And pretty soon you're almost wore out in it and kind of ready for the day to be over, really, if you don't know the truth. But I wonder, I wonder how much the rest of the world is doing their own deep dive. You see, all the resources are available. God has given us everything necessary for life and godliness. He hasn't given us a spirit of timidity or stupidity, either one. Everybody that I know has got the same equipment I got if you're born again. So when did America get shallow? When did our roots get where we're not deep? Where we don't think deep? We don't believe deep. We don't live deep. It's easy. I talked to a pastor about this a long time last night. I said it gets real easy because Christians are used to being spoon-fed. And if you get to a part that's not very palatable, we'll rearrange it. We'll fix the composition so it's more tasty. And we'll keep spoon-feeding you. If we spoon-feed you, then pretty soon you're dependent on us. If you're dependent on me, my position is secure. Be careful. Be very, very careful. You better live the next few days like your vote decides the election. And by the way, double check your ballots. Just a little word of advice. If you hadn't got it on your mind yet to vote, get over and vote. We voted on the first day in case I got killed in a car wreck on the second day. 
and be sure that I had said my piece. And I checked my ballot twice. Check your ballots. Okay? But vote like, vote like you're the guy that decides the election. And then begin to live. Like, live like you're the one guy that can find the answer to everything and fix everything and that you count. Live like you count. You count. Live deep. And live like you'll never have another preacher in your life again. You see, that never gets said in Christianity. Can you live as a Christian without a preacher? You ain't kidding, and most of us would do it better. Most of us guys, if we're not careful, we'll we'll spend more time getting in the way than we do getting out the way. And so I was able to teach on fasting yesterday morning to the letter. Because one day a long time ago after I got born again, I read three words in the Bible that says, When you fast. Do you know what three words I've never read in the Bible in all the years I've been a Christian? When you go to church, do it this way. It's not in there. A lot of things that are. So we're going to talk about some things real quick tonight. We're going to share in the Passover meal again tonight. We're going to spend some time praising and thanking God tonight. We're going to spend a little time praying tonight. Just kind of putting the finishing touch on the last day of the Feast of Booths, the day of a proclamation. Hey, I do want I do want to brag on God just a little, not me. And Robin was I was so glad she was in the pickup with me yesterday on speakerphone. But there's a very nice lady in California that had read this proclamation and it it's dated but she she thinks it needs to be an ongoing thing to encourage people to fast and pray and be involved in our country and repent and all that stuff. And she said, I wanted permission to to take the date out, but I want to print it in the paper and stuff like that. But this lady used more big words in the first two minutes she was on the phone than I'll, I'll ever use in my entire life. 30 seconds. She was really smart. I mean, this lady had a vocabulary now. And she has no idea how dumb and redneck this guy is on the other side of the phone. And she began to tell me why she was so impressed with how well written, how perfect the grammar was, the details, the depth of this little proclamation. You know why? Because it came from the Lord. I gave Ransom one of these the other day, and I said, keep that. Keep it. I said, it's one of those times that God spoke to your papa, so keep it. You may want to remember that one of these days. But I want to read it to you again tonight because for everybody that took this to heart and participated, the ones that are watching today from Sweetwater, Texas, and Burwell, Nebraska, and California, and Tennessee. Oh, I know I'll leave some out, but all over the country, people are joining with us tonight right here to fellowship together. Pastors stopped what they're doing, and they're going to join with us tonight because today has been important. Today was a day that if you've spent this last week and you spent today, you'll never be the same as you were a week ago. If you spent time tabernacling with God and dying to yourself and seeking the Lord, you probably probably found out more about you than you wanted to. I know I did. But at the same time, you can leave here better focused, intentional, strengthened, empowered, everything necessary to pull it off because 
I don't care what they'll tell you in a football stadium in Houston on a Sunday morning, but I'll tell you now, living for the Lord's hard. It is that narrow road is definitely narrow. It's not easy. And playing church won't cut it. And we all know that. So I'm just going to read this proclamation again, and then I got some things I want to share with you. But it, it simply said, for those of you that hadn't heard it or read it, we the people in humble expectation are setting aside a day, October 23rd, 2024, as a day for humiliation, fasting, and prayer for our nation, the United States of America. We believe we are one nation under God. We know He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Our faith in Him is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As did so many before us, such as George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, we too are trusting in the promises of God Almighty on behalf of our nation for the preservation of freedom, the Constitution, Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, and God's Holy Word. The 23rd of October being the last day of Sukkot, or Feast of Booths, directly ties us to the promise made to Abraham, a promise of family, generations, and a piece of land. That promise was duly executed at the Passover. Our covenant with that promise was purchased at the fulfilled Passover, the sacrifice of the Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. As co-heirs to the promise, accepting the responsibility as engrafted branches, we now call for the reinstatement of the Passover throughout the Christian community in the United States. We commit ourselves not only to prayer and fasting, but also repentance for our religious practices that have separated us, separated us from the assistance of Almighty God. We expect by faith for His purposes, by providence, to prevail in these tumultuous times. Revival in our capital and across our land is of the highest priority. It is now time for self-examination, prayer, and fasting. We proclaim October 23, 2024, to be that day. Signed, We the People. If I've learned anything or taught anything in the last four or five months around here, is the importance of We the People. We're only good as a group as we become okay as individuals. It's kind of like marriage, you know, that one Jerry Maguire movie, you know, and they look at each other and say, you complete me. That's bull. That's bull. Jesus Christ will help you become completed. And when the two of you find your way to that spot, you'll make a really good couple. It's the same way with a congregation, a community, or a nation. No matter who wins on the 5th of November, and I believe we're truly headed in a good spot. I've told you before, nobody relax. Everybody votes like your life depending on it. Be sure you pick the right man. Uh, I don't want to say any names or anything. From Just make it, just get the right man. You'll do fine. <laughs> But if we don't get the White House, the House, and the Senate, you're in for four more years of nothing. There's a real good chance that this powder keg called the metropolitan areas of the United States of America will explode on the 6th of November. There's a good chance there'll be a lot of chaos no matter how it goes. Evil is going to have its way no matter what. So it's my job as the leader of a group of individuals to encourage you and empower you to be sure that you've got your house in order. Be sure that you're ready to take the lead. Men, I'm talking to you. You be sure that you're ready to speak the Word of God over every situation. You be sure that you've made time to get on your knees and pray. You be sure to, that you can exercise the things of God and not get trapped into believing you're the exercising the things of God when you've simply been exercising the religion of man. That's huge. It's time to go home. And every time we come here, I'm going to have something to help you go home. 
I told a young pastor the other day while I was sharing in his congregation, you know what really good preaching is? Is a guy that's been diving into that book and then trying to do what it says, finding out what it really says, find out what works, find out through trial and error, find out testing the waters a little bit, and then coming back and telling all the people what you found out while you was home monkeying around in the kingdom of God. That's good preaching. Not the stuff that comes out of somebody else's book or a file cabinet or something else. Just spirit-led living according to the word of God. And so tonight, I, I, I just I said, Lord, uh, what, am, what, am I, what, am I, what do you want me to talk about tonight? I mean, where where are we at? So after the Feast of Booths is over, where does everybody go? Where does everybody go after you've been in your temporary shelters and doing your thing here for the last week? Where does everybody go, Murph? Where do they go? Go back home. Where did they direct you to go for the Passover? Home. Go home. You see, institutionalized religion was never the idea of God. He did not do this. I don't care how you make it up or your goose pimples or your favorite song. I don't care. He may be in it because Christians are in it. But he didn't do it. Not like what we're doing. Not what we do all over America. What he did institute was the family. So he said, go home to your household. Find a lamb. You see, the lamb has always been the way out. (laughs) See, I've been so clueless tonight, Murph, until now. And when he told Abraham, he said, get your son. I'll meet you up here on the hill. When he gets there, don't don't sacrifice the generations. There's a ram in the bush. There's a lamb. John the Baptist was the first to know it the best. Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. In the Passover, he said, go home. Go home. What do we celebrate at Easter? We're going to go home, aren't we? But our home's in heaven, isn't it? Huh? Isn't it all about getting out of here? Isn't that what Christianity's all about, y'all? Come on. We got to get them saved because one day we're going to put them in a box and stuff them in a hole, and some preacher's going to have to stand there and lie over their carcass. Come on. It's all about where you end up, isn't it? Huh? Isn't that how it's been, your entire saved life? Isn't that what it's about? We're going to all be in heaven, old Beulah land, and some glad morning I'll fly away. And we, you know, and then and once you get people thinking that away, then it don't matter if you come from England or Timbuktu, you can walk in there with a theory about some kind of beam me up Scotty idea that, and then let some preacher get a hold of it, and you better be gripping the back of that pew every Sunday morning because one of these days the rapture's coming. Come on, I'm preaching good. I've been auctioneering horse sales my whole life. I can tell what you're stepping in. You aren't going to lie to me. If I think you're lying to me, I'm going to go find out. That's why I stand up here and talk like I do, because I went and found out. I don't just believe what people told me. And then I found a promise that said I could have a family and I'm going to have generations. Look, the first generation that me and Robin got to put on this earth, I'm nuts about them. That next batch, whoo, doggies. Gets even better. I don't know how many generations I get to be alive for, but I got this sneaking hunch that it's more blessed every time. 
It's a blessing. Why? Because it's part of the promise. Where was the Passover leading to? The promise. That was the first step heading towards the promise. Kill a lamb. Put the blood over the doorpost. Get your belt on. Get ready. You and your household get ready. You and your household get ready. If America is ever going to find her spot again, she's going to have to reclaim it, and the king is going to have to do it. And the king in this earth is we the people, and it's the only ones that really have the wherewithal to do it are the ones where Jesus is our king. That's it. And so he says right here, I said, Lord, where, show me something. And it was right there in front of me. Luke 6, 46. If you got your Bible. I really don't even have to read it. I've read this so many times. I, said, I think I got a better understanding of it now today than, than I've ever had. But why do you call me Lord, Lord? God, I can just quit right there. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you won't vote? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you won't participate? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, you're not a doer of the word? Why do you call me Lord, Lord? Is it easy to raise your hands and sing to the Lord Jesus Christ and get goose pimples all over yourself and all you're all jazzed up here of a day? But what about in the morning when you call me Lord, Lord? He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, yet you do not do what I say? Do you know the problem? I don't think we know what he says. Observe the Passover. Observe Pentecost. Observe the Feast of Booths. Find Christ in it. Find Christ. All kinds of things that he says. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Let me tell you something today that's really blunt, really bold, but I am sick of listening to it. I heard, I heard a lady in my car say it perfectly yesterday. I am sick of hearing trunk or treat. If you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. I'm sick of paganism. I'm sick of evil worship. Do you know that's one of the most dangerous things of an open southern border? People from Haiti coming here doing voodoo? You know, I was really upset with Donald Trump talking about people killing dogs and cats while he's in the middle of a debate, and I thought that was the dumbest thing I ever heard until I knew exactly where the root of it came from. That's what you do if you're a voodooist. A Haitian voodooist. The spirituality that we've allowed into our nation, and yet... All, not all, but a lot of Christendom this next week, we're going to have trunk or treat, and we're going to, you know, celebrate witches and stuff, but we've turned it into a fall festival. And you know what? Your fall festival, Jiminy Pete, you missed the Feast of Booth. You missed the in harvest. You missed the Day of Atonement. You missed the whole cotton picking thing, but you followed a calendar that said we should do Halloween. Well, let me tell you, don't leave here and go do Easter and think you're okay with God anymore either. I'm done with it. I'm done. I'm not counting down. I have put my voice out there to hundreds of thousands of people now for a while, and I have begged for a fight. I have begged for a fight, and I can't find one. If you can substantiate the paganism that we do in our modern day religion, you bring your Bible, your denominational doctrine, all your all your deals that you guys roll up your your with your, your, your proclamations and all your stuff. Bring them to me. Bring them. Every one of you, from the Vatican on down, Marshall, Texas. 710 East American Boulevard. Call me on the telephone. 806-786-7539. You call me on the phone. You bring all your stuff. And let's talk about it. And I bet I get to rope all next week. 
Nobody's going to bother me. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and won't do what I said? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I'll show you whom he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug down deep, not shallow, deep. You have to be a deep individual. We can't be a deep organization. You got to go deep. And you can't go deep by what somebody else tells you. If you get directives and things from what I tell you or anybody else, and it spurs you in the right direction, that was just your starting gate to keep moving on your own. There wasn't a spot where you find and you land and you come back next week. They dug deep. And if you'll go deep enough, you'll find out just what a heresy Christianity is in America today. And he laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the streams beat vehemently against the house. Man, we have not in America for a long time, we have not seen this firsthand like we've been able to see in not our community, but many around our country. The floods that have just wiped out entire communities. A flood in the middle of the desert in Roswell, New Mexico. I mean, for crying out loud. And when it comes and beats against the house, it couldn't shake it, for it was founded on the rock. You see, this is what's wrong with the great escape mentality of citizenship that that places you somewhere besides where you're actually at. Yes, my citizenship's in heaven. Let me explain that to you real quick. Do you know what that means? That means I have vowed an allegiance to the kingdom of God. That means that I've surrendered myself to the rules, precepts, and ordinances of the kingdom of God. I am now a citizen of the kingdom of God. But if you don't believe that the kingdom is here now upon us, within us, and at hand, then you have no hope in this. You have to have beam me up, Scotty. You'll have to have six guys drop you in a hole. If you've not realized the kingdom of God now, don't expect to realize it later. He said, lest a man be born again, he will not see, nor will he enter the kingdom of God. You're supposed to see and experience the kingdom of God now. That's where my citizenship is because King Jesus rules in my life by the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. But I also have a dual citizenship. Right now, I'm a member of the United States of America. I'm a voting, active, tax-paying member of the United States of America. Therefore, when our Pledge of Allegiance is said or when our national anthem is played, when that flag is flown, I will stand up and vow my commitment to the land that God promised me, a land with borders on purpose for a purpose, a land designed by God one nation under God, three branches of government to protect my God-given rights. That's the nation I live, the United States of America, where I can fulfill my promise of marrying the woman of my dreams and having children, and they'll have children, and a land for us to dwell. That Acts 17 says that you dwell in a land, a land with borders ordained at a proper time, that you might grow up and seek and find the Lord. That's what we've been doing this week, tabernacling. We've been groping. I have. I've been groping and I've been seeking. Here, in Bailey County, Texas, in the United States of America, not somewhere else, here is where I found him. Here is where we've been tabernacling together. Here. So yes, I have a citizenship in heaven. Everywhere that I have citizenship, I also have now been given responsibility. You know why people come into this country and live like scabs? Because they've never bowed, they've never bowed to the king. They've never bowed to the Constitution. They've never bowed to the Bill of Rights. The word illegal doesn't even mean illegal anymore. If you fly another flag while you're in this nation, that is a sign that says you belong somewhere else. You should dial up Siri because you got bad directions. You are definitely in the wrong place. Yet all over Christianity, we got people who pretend to have citizenship in the kingdom of God or are promised some later on sometime, someplace without commitment. 
and bearing no responsibility. That's not how it should be. But if you build your house on the rock, it doesn't say if the torrent comes. It says when. If I have any love for you and your family whatsoever in me, I will tell you every hard thing you need to know to get your family in order. Get your house in order. Denounce paganism. Worship God. Don't be a follower of religion, but a follower of a man and let his name be Jesus Christ. Find your hunger in the power of the Holy Spirit for the Word of God that you will become a disciple. Discipleship simply means to become a student of. I've never been to the National Finals Rodeo inside the dirt. I have sat in the bleachers once. I've watched on TV a lot. I've watched a lot of team roping. How many of y'all would believe that? If you don't believe that, ask my wife. I know a lot about team roping. I know every rule in every organization. I know the history. I know where the events are. I know everything. Because I've studied it. Do I know everything about the Bible and everything about the kingdom of God? Not yet. You see, the kingdom of God is a lot bigger than team roping. But I'm working on it. And every little bit I find something. It says, hey, build your, build your house right here. Put this, put this rock in here. Stand on this. Stand on this. You see, the kingdom that I live in cannot be shaken, turned upside down, blown over sideways. It cannot be disrupted by evil. It cannot be lied to and accept the lie. The king knows the whole truth and nothing but the truth, and he knows every lie out there as well. Cannot be moved. So when the torrent comes, when the, when the, when the torrent comes, your house better be built on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing, You don't know why America is like we are now? We did nothing. And we paid people to do nothing. For a lot of, a lot of families in America today, the generations are how they are because we did nothing. Let me expand on that right quick. I want, I'd like, I want chapter and verse. On God's command or directive or even just a precept of man, woman come together for the purpose of bringing forth godly offspring. But in the process, be sure you find the right person to train your kids. Come on, I'm preaching good. I'm God, so I'll have a lot of places for you to drop them off. No, sir. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And you don't do what I said. Now, I'm not standing up here like a guy that's got all his ducks in a row. I'm barely getting them in a group. I'm a guy with plenty of regret when it comes to that area right there. I'm a guy who wakes up and prays every day for ways to fix it, ways to reconcile, ways to get things just like I want them and just like I think God would want them. I've made so many mistakes while I've been standing up here preaching to y'all, you couldn't count them all. If you'll go tabernacle with God he'll he'll even show you some of them but only the ones you haven't dealt with yet <laughs> the rest of them he doesn't remember but he said if 
If you did nothing, he's like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Whether you're talking about a home and a family and a kitchen table or you're talking about a community, we've warned our community for 22 years. Sunday morning ain't going to cut it. And whatever you crack the door to, you'll never shut. So alcohol will lead to pot shops and yada, 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 all the way up into your school systems and everything. And, and what you allow them to take away, you're never going to put back. Do you know how we got prayer back in our courthouse? Did y'all know we had prayer in our courthouse in Bailey County? Do y'all know that? You know how we got prayer back in the courthouse? A man would walk in there and pray. We didn't have a city ordinance or anything. A man would just walk in there and pray. See, that's how you get prayer in your school or in your business. Or, But let's try it at home first. You see, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? But you won't do what I say. We don't want to do the work. So men, are you praying? And pray where your kids can see you. That don't hurt nothing. Is your Bible worn out? Because you've been doing a deep dive. You've been digging deep. I know I'm singing to the choir in this group because there's a lot of you that I, I know you. And I know how you are. And I've been on this vein for a long time. I've always known men were the bullseye. They were the key to the whole thing. Men that would teach their children about the kingdom of God. Men who would pray and protect their families in the spiritual realm. Men who would edify their wives and help them become the women of God that, that God intended them to be. Men who would find their way with their families and not not be tangled up in, in just in religion. I've seen so many young people that just got so sick about hearing about Jesus and so sick of just watching their parents do one thing on Sunday and another thing on Monday. And then, you know, and the desires of their heart was to be somewhere and do something. I'm one of them. Alan, how many Sundays am I somewhere else? Most of them. Not always because I want to be. Sometimes I have to be. But there's days I want to be somewhere else. Do you know your kids want to be somewhere else? My God, mine ain't going to be somewhere else. We're going to sit right there and we're going to get on that third row every week and I'm going to choke them down with a necktie and we're going to blah, 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 blah. You're idiots. Oh, Robin told me not to say that anymore. But the proof's in the pudding. It didn't work. As soon as they got smoke over their head and wheels under their butt, they were gone. What would have really been good is maybe just go where they wanted to go and pray with them and their friends, share a scripture before a football game. The first time a kid got knocked out on the field, you've got down there on your knees and laid on him and prayed. See, I don't know how they do it at football games. That's how we did it at junior rodeos. I was trying to do what the Lord said to do. There were things that other Christians were doing, and I couldn't find in here where the Lord said to do them. So in order to be the best I could for my family, I just tried to do what the Lord said to do. And he said to pray. He said to believe. He said to meditate on his word. He said to speak his word. He said to recognize and realize the kingdom of God. He said I could speak to a mountain and it'd be removed. He said I could pray over a sick horse and it'd be healed. He said I could pray over a sick kid and they'd be healed. He said he would comfort me and my family anytime we had heartache or anything going on in our life. He said even when we were broke that he would supply every need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Jesus. And so we just began to exercise those things. I just want to exercise the thing of God. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do the things everybody else says? And I'm about done. 
But I think the Lord wanted to make a point tonight for each one of us as individuals. I want to pray for our nation right quick as a group. When I get done praying, there'll be a small pause. If any of you have a, a word of some kind that you want to speak into the atmosphere, it'll be a time to do that. Just Just pray. If we stay silent for just a little bit, then I'll close and then we're going to open up the table. And the Murphs are going to come go first and then they're going to play. We'll take communion together as families and friends. And we're going to celebrate what we know the Lord has done because we've been obedient to the Lord. So we know that we're in a good place and we can celebrate that tonight. And we can rejoice in that tonight. So let's pray. Lord, tonight I just come before you. And Lord, you and I have talked a lot about my life. But Lord, I want to thank you for every individual that has an ear to your kingdom. Has an ear to your voice. I want to thank you for every individual who understands the power of citizenship in your kingdom and the responsibility of citizenship in this nation. I want to thank you tonight, Jesus. You said, Lord, pray for the workers in the harvest, for the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few, and I'm I'm praying for the few tonight, Lord, and I'm giving you thanks for those who will stand up and those who will participate, those who will dig deep, those who are concerned about their house, those who want to build it on the rock, those who want to preserve our heritage and our inheritance here in this earth. So, Lord, I thank you for them, and we come together tonight in unison, Lord, and we pray with one voice. We pray. I'm reminded, Lord, of how the Father of our nation prayed as he got down on one knee, and he called on you, Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, who could reroute enemies, change the hearts of kings who would carry an army under the wing of your protection so God tonight just as the father of this nation prayed I'm on my knees and I pray that by your divine providence and your power Lord we're a people who have sought after your face and we have sought your will and we pray tonight We pray tonight, Jesus, for the United States of America to come back to her place as one nation under God, you, God Almighty. That we come back as a nation who will once again reclaim our heritage through through your word, Lord. That we reestablish our families and take responsibility for the generations. And that we protect our Constitution and Bill of Rights and Declaration of Independence. That we protect our borders. That we take care of our sovereignty and our solvency. Lord, that we find our place as a lighthouse to the nations. We find our place as your hands and feet in the world. That we find our voice of authority that comes only from you as we stand with our brothers and sisters in Israel. Lord, there's a pathway to this. And I pray that we'll find it. That we'll seek after it and that we'll participate. Last but not least tonight, Lord, I'm begging you to forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, as we have failed to do what you say. Forgive us that we have followed the Pied Piper as opposed to the voice of the shepherd. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us as individuals. Forgive us as a nation. Restore us, just as your servant David said, restore us to the joy of your salvation. Restore us as a nation, Lord, to fulfill your purposes. Help us to stand against evil in God. If you would if you would just extend your long arm of righteousness against the evil in this land, smite 
evil in this land, Lord. And help us as your people not to promote it, not to permit it, and definitely not to protect it. Smite evil. Let your judgment come. Lord, tonight I lift up this great United States of America. May this be a nation that lives to your glory for generations to come as we occupy awaiting your return. Lord, we pray that you'll be pleased with us. Help us to live in a way that pleases you. We give you praise tonight, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Anybody got a word? Dusty? Psalms 20, verse 4, he says, May he grant you, according to your heart's desire, and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation. In the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now, I know that the Lord saves his anointed, and he will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dusty. Good word. Anybody else? You got something, Murph? Show him just rocking in that chair right there. We started the Sakat, you know, a week ago. We could go tonight. And a week ago, at 3.45, the Lord woke me up wide awake. And I started interceding for my daughter that's fixing to have a baby. And I'm laying in bed, and Rhonda's asleep, and I'm laying in bed, and I see my light go on my phone. And it's Maddie. She had texted me. It's 4 o'clock. This is 15 minutes later. She said, "We're looks like it started, fixing to have this baby. And, you know, I got to go see this little girl, the 14th grandchild. And this little girl is going to grow up in a, in a Christian home and with her two big brothers. And because <laughs> it's her daddy, my little granddaughter's daddy gave his life to the Lord at roping camp. And his fruit is right here. That's his mom and dad are a big part of this place. And you know, the scripture says that you bear fruit in your old age. And you're starting to bear fruit, but I'm talking about when you're old, Steve, and my granddaughters and my grandsons are in high school and college and start leading people to the Lord, it's going to be because of their daddy received the seed and now it's bearing fruit and it's going to bear fruit and it's bearing fruit right now. And so uh, you're bearing fruit. You're bearing fruit. Yeah, we are. We know that. I mean, you know that, but uh, there it is. She's a week old too. That's a good. It's a good little. That's a good deal. Good little, good little deal. So. That's good. Amen. Anybody else got anything, right quick? Okay, Jim. If you and Rhonda want to come up and, and then we'll get a little music going and. While they're taking communion, it's. Look, I'm I'm just a mere ordinary man. Same as everybody else. So there's days that the things we're called to do around here get a little tiresome. There's days we get a little pooped out. There's days that I even talk about quitting. I ain't going anywhere. Okay? 
It's not because I'm afraid of failing. But as I tabernacled with God again today, and he reminded me of all those faces at roping camp. And then a pile of them are still here. And then there's a pile of new ones that came. And uh, I'd walk through hot coals barefooted to get to hang out with y'all and talk about Jesus and do what we do. So, Robin, she never looks grumpy, but if I ever get to looking a little grumpy, just kick me in the hind end and we're going to keep rolling. I hope someday when Jared and Maddie's kids get to having their kids, maybe somewhere around there somebody will have a roping camp. Wouldn't that be a good idea? But when you commission men to go home, it means something. Y'all come share at the table, bring your family, spend time in prayer, praise, whatever you want to do. If you're standing there and somebody around you doesn't have a partner, put your arm around their neck and put them in your group. Remember, it's by that blood that we're forgiven and the sacrifice of a perfect man for an imperfect people. It's the Lord's Passover. It's the Lord's Passover. He said, do this as often as you think of me. So on a day like today, how would you think of anybody else? So. There's only 500 times in the Bible you're supposed to blow the shofar, and this is one of them. It says that when you're in battle, blow the shofar. When you're fixing to have an election... Y'all didn't know this, but the first I just found this out this week. First Kings, one one, the one, the first Kings chapter one talks about when Adonijah wanted to be king, and Solomon was the anointed one. And David said, "Get the priests, go blow the shofar, and that will seal the deal." And he was, and 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 then when Ad, Adonijah, they's already celebrating the victory. And when they heard the sound of the shofar, they looked around and said, what is that? And all his, all his buddies, they hit the road. That was it. The demons left. So the, we're in a battle. We're fixing to have an election. It says to blow the shofar at the end of the morning, the morning, the sadness of Sukkot, the, the, it says, Blow the shofar. It says when Jesus comes back, he's going to blow the shofar. And that's what, that's what just scares the heck out of the demons. They think this thing is, is the one Jesus is going to blow. They're, that's why they run off. They're going to they're run off tonight. They've, they're, already not, they're already not even here anyway. But So I'm going to blow the shofar again. For the battle, for the election, for the ending of uh, Sukkot, and and pronounce that Jesus is the king. Amen? Amen. Y'all agree with that? Here we go. This is what the Lord said. He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? And Mark has been doing what he said many times, but especially with that so far, the Lord said that this house, our house, this United States, built on this. Here we go. 